Once again, if you're here for mending and fiber arts, that's down the hall. But here, and here on the computer on the Zoom machine, is uh, Intro to Home Recording, part one of two. This time, we'll be uh, covering a lot of the physical things, the, well, equipment, uh, concepts, and recording. And then next time, we'll get into all the processing and um, fun things we can do to our audio afterward. But you might ask, who are you to teach us such things? Um, I'm Franklin Walther. I'm the digital services librarian here at the Mill Valley Public Library. Um, and what are my qualifications? Well, I've been home recording for over 20 years, I guess, as one of my hobbies that I kind of uh, switch the searchlight to. Slowly adding to the old knowledge, I'm not a professional. Never been in a professional recording studio, don't play in bands. I can hammer on a keyboard a little and strum some guitars, but I'm not really a musician. I don't make that claim. Um, which, of course, all of this makes me an expert. <laughs> Isn't it possible that maybe aliens started recording? Um, you want to record. You might want to record your voice for a podcast or uh, narrating a video or any sort of thing like that. Um, but you might want to record instruments. You're a musician. Uh, you might want to make field recordings of birdsong. Whatever brings you to wanting to capture sound, you want to record. Now, do you need one of these hellacious, enormous machines that cost tens of thousands of dollars? No. If you happen to have one in your house, you just sort of found it, that's great. Um, good luck learning all. It's actually a little bit simpler than it appears. We'll, we'll cover it. Um, but fortunately, you don't need to have one of these to record at home and even do a little bit of fanciness at home. Um, nowadays, we have computers and we have ever cheapening and ever, like, ever more accessible ways of doing this. Today, we're going to take a journey. How we get from sound to an electronic signal to a recording that we can work with. So that's kind of our arc today. The journey of audio. I feel like it should be a film strip. All right, we should probably start at the beginning. Uh, what, what exactly is sound when we talk about sound? Why, it's vibrations propagating through a medium, of course. And that could be air, could be water, could be magma under the earth. All can carry sound because they can all vibrate with uh, compression, rarefaction. If it's vibrating about between about 20 times per second and about 20,000, we humans hear it as sound. Um, below 20 times a second, it really is just like a rumbling feeling. Above 20,000, we can't hear it. And if you're, by the time we're my age, uh, that's that number, <laughs> that top end number is going down. Um, we can't hear the highest frequency sounds anymore. My daughter, who's eight, loves to point that out and remind me that I can't hear what she can hear. I can hear plenty. How are we going to capture it? We're going to transduce it. That's the fancy term. So we're going to convert it from one kind of energy to another. How do you do that, you ask? Well, a good way of doing that is with microphones. The wonder of the modern age, the microphone. These convert sound energy into electrical energy that then we can work with. There are a lot of different designs of microphones and ways to do this, and we're going to cover them um, not necessarily because you want to get into the nitty gritty of the electronics, but they have different characteristics, which will help you make decisions about what kind you want to use, what kind you want to have. So there are a few big categories. First, dynamic. What does that mean? Well, thanks to physics and the universe, if you have a coil of wire that's moving through a magnetic field, you'll get a voltage change. Um, and that's just, just, just how things work. And this is good for our purposes, because that means, um, however small that voltage fluctuation is, we can get information out of it. So in a dynamic microphone, sound comes on in, hits a diaphragm, like a disc, and actually moves, wiggles this coil, because the sound, of course, is vibrations, and it's blah, 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 blah. It moves that whole coil, um, and then you get your voltage output. Nope. What are some characteristics of this kind of microphone? Well, 
Dynamic microphones are really rugged. Um, the circuitry is simple. What they're made out of is very robust. And you'll see these on stage a lot. Um, for one very good reason, that if you drop it or smack it with a drumstick, it'll live. It'll survive. There's a famous Shure SM58 that has seen some stuff in its life and probably still works fine. Below that is this lovely graph. Um, that's called a frequency response graph or plot. Um, and roughly, don't trust these entirely because the way they're sampled is questionable. This will generally give you an idea of how the sound is reproduced by this kind of microphone from the very lowest, way down on the bottom end, up to the very highest. So how much, how much response to that particular part of the spectrum, low to high, do we get? It's relatively flat in the middle, has some little bumps and peaks, and then kind of falls off toward the very high end there. Dynamics, they generally produce less detail in the high end. They sound a little less naturalistic a more, and a little bit more like you're talking into a microphone, because you are. Um, a little bit. They vary. Uh, but they also, as a plus, tend to reject more of the extraneous sound around you um, and just focus on the source. This can be good if you're in a somewhat noisy environment. Right? It's looking really just at you, primarily. Dynamic microphones, because it's just physically moving that coil, the output, what comes out of that, the signal that comes out of them is very slight and small. They need a lot of amplification afterward to make sense of this information and to use it in our recording. So when you have your little gain knob, which we'll cover in a bit, expect to crank it for a um, dynamic microphone, unless you're playing an electric guitar amplifier into it or something like that. But for just voice, expect that it will need a lot of gain to get up there. There's another kind of dynamic microphone, same sort of principle, it's called a ribbon microphone. And what if, instead of the little circular diaphragm, we had an extremely thin ribbon of metal, often aluminum, that is in a magnetic field and does the wiggling itself. Uh, no coil involved, but it's the same kind of idea. Um, Yeah, that's a ribbon microphone. It's basically a dynamic, but a different sort of function. Ribbon mics tend to sound warm and smooth because as you can see in this graph, the response to the high end stuff falls off a lot, quite a bit. This varies again by microphone to microphone. Um, and some of that smoothness and warmness, this can be a good thing. Um, because they're slow to respond to transients. They smooth out sounds a little bit. These were used a lot in the old days for voice, uh, and they're good for like strings, violins and such, because they just sort of smooth out some of the harsh stuff a little bit. Uh, another interesting thing about ribbon microphones is, by design, almost all of them will hear what's in front of them and what's behind them, and then not what's on the sides, because of the ribbon. It's called a figure eight polar pattern, which we will cover. But an interesting quirk of these. Um, yeah, so they sound warm and smooth. There's old blue eyes. He's going to sing into a uh, ribbon microphone there. Even more so than other dynamics, these microphones will need a lot of gain. Uh, you'll need to just crank that thing up if you want to hear it. And ribbons are very fragile, unlike dynamics that you could throw on the floor. A ribbon, even if you, you might blow on it a little too hard and shatter and break that tiny, perfectly tensioned, very thin ribbon. Ultimately, this is probably not your first choice if you're starting recording. There, you can be finicky beasts, and the good ones are very, very expensive. That's true of just about everything, but let's talk about the third type, a condenser microphone. Um, and a condenser or capacitor microphone, if you're British, this works a little bit differently. Sound waves are still hitting a diaphragm and making it wiggle, but in this case, right behind the diaphragm is a back plate, and the diaphragm getting closer and farther from it um, is how we get our uh, capacitance change here. Another electronic fluctuation that we can use to represent the sound. That back plate is polarized by external power, usually. 
Um, why this little microphone I'm talking into is also a condenser, a wee little condenser. But then blah, 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 fiddly electronics details, yada, yada, amplification, outcomes are sound. I'm interested in this stuff up to a point, and then when I start looking at circuit diagrams, it's too much for me. But the analogy I always make is we don't need to be able to personally design, engineer, and build a car to be pretty good at driving one. So I'm more of a car driver than a car builder. What are some characteristics of these microphones? They tend to capture more high-end detail than other types. These will be the ones that sound or are most capable of reproducing sound like it is in the real world. Not that not doing that isn't, is bad, but these will give the most detailed reproduction. They're very light little diaphragms that can move quickly, and just physically that means they can respond to transients, sudden sounds. Um, and you may have a bunch of options and uh, switches to switch on your microphone. They can do things like change the polar pattern, what it hears around it. Um, you can roll off the low frequencies. Our voices, below about 100 cycles per second, 100 hertz, it's not much there, unless you're James Earl Jones or uh, Barry White or something like that. The, the very, very lowest parts of the spectrum are usually not in our voices. What is? Rumbles, uh, bumps from hitting the floor near the microphone stand, stuff like that. So it might be a good idea just to ignore that right from the microphone. You can roll that off. Uh, you might have a pad switch, and this takes the, it makes it less sensitive. If you're putting a condenser in front of a really loud source, this means it won't get overwhelmed. Now, in order for these to work, that backplate I talked about needs some external power to polarize it. What this means in our actual lives is that if we have a condenser microphone, it needs something called phantom power. We turn that on or off. Um, that's usually supplied by the preamp. The thing we'll plug it into as we get to the end of all this, this journey. Um, just make sure your microphone is connected when you're turning that on or off uh, so you don't hit it immediately with a big boom of power. There are two types of condensers, or it could be in between, but you might have a large diaphragm on this condenser, and large means like an inch across. Um, those are, I mean, the very famous, the one on the left there is the Neumann U87, a very, very famous uh, condenser microphone. They use it at NPR. It's in studios all over the world. It's $3,500. If you have to ask, you can't afford the vintage ones. Now, the larger diaphragms in these microphones, they capture lower frequencies well, so they can be on everything from acoustic guitar to pianos, to your big beefy strings, your cello, your blah, 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 double bass, um, bass amps, all kinds of things. There's another kind of condenser, small diaphragm. Um, these respond faster to transients and generally reproduce the whole frequency range a little more evenly. Again, not that that's a good or bad thing in itself. Uh, they do have a touch more noise, self-noise in them, but not any that we'd really notice, probably. Often you, they stick these overhead a drum kit and hear the cymbals and just a general picture. And they're good for all kinds of acoustic instruments, if you're playing your guitar um, or your violin or what have you. Polar patterns, I kind of mentioned this, but microphones can hear what's going on around them in um, a number of different ways, with a number of different focuses. And this is actually done with a little baffling and um, perforations and like physical design to change how the microphone hears. And some microphones will allow you to switch between these. Most common is that cardioid shape um, up at the top right. Cardioid because it looks like a heart or in that orientation, like a butt. But cardioid is probably better to call it. Um, figure eight we talked about, that's right next to it, and that is in front of it and behind it, but not to the sides. The sort of circles are what it's gonna hear. Omnidirectional, here's all around, more or less evenly. That's great if you have your bluegrass group and you're all leaning in to sing all at the same time. Um, great or the only thing they could do back in the old days. Um, there are variations of cardioid, too. Um, hypercardioid or supercardioid. I don't, I'm not even sure which one of those is which exactly. But the idea is it's a little more focused in front. 
like you're narrowing that flashlight beam, but you get a little bloop out the back, <laughs> directly out of the back. Cardioid don't hear out the back, cardioid mics don't hear out the back. Another reason why they're great on stage, if you have your monitor speakers so you can hear yourself coming up at you, the microphone won't hear those, it'll hear what's in front of it. Or if you have something noisy behind the microphone, your computer makes a loud no uh, fan noise. You know, if you have a dynamic, a cardioid, um, position that so it's not listening to that. Uh, the extreme end is what's called a shotgun microphone's pickup pattern. That's those really long tubes that they hang over people in video production. And that is a real, like that's a, tele, a reverse telescope, um, listening to a very small area. And that's why they're used to try to capture dialogue, people talking from farther away. Because they really zero in on that and don't pick up a lot of extraneous stuff. Um, they use that in the NPR Tiny Desk concert all the time. I'm not sure why exactly, but they really like those. Uh, before we head onward to cables, I'd just like to give a real world examination. I'm going to go over my uh, table of earthly delights here. It'll be a little strange for you physically because I'm turning away from you, but you'll get a close up view. Here's a real world dynamic microphone. This is the Sennheiser E835. Um, it's one of those. Nice, robust ones. I don't have to feel bad about doing that. Plugs in down at the bottom. Um, if you get one of these, I have learned, you might want to look for one that doesn't, isn't completely round. They tend to roll off the table. But they're dynamics. They can handle it. Um, to show a condenser, the library has some of these for use in our recording booth, which you better expect I'll talk up later. Here's a condenser microphone, a Warm Audio WA87, which is designed to be like that $3,500 microphone. And it is a good example of one that's covered in options and switches. Ah, you can see the diaphragm in there. That's our little one inch diaphragm. On the front here, I have switches. We have to think backwards to move my hands. Um, right now it's in cardioid, and I could move that little switch to make it omnidirectional or uh, figure eight. Just with the flick of a switch. On the back, we have more, come on, brain, we have more <laughs> switches. Um, this one is our pad, can knock off 10 dB of sound if we have something really loud. And here's our roll off the bottom end. So your microphone may or may not have all those bells and whistles and controls. We have a couple of ribbons, but I didn't get them out. I'm sorry, there's just so much, <laughs> so much here today. Let's march on. Cables. Got a microphone, great. But we need to get this information somewhere else. Hence the cable. And you'll find all kinds of cables in your recording life, um, often, and with microphones. Something called XLR, extremely low resistance. And this is great to run these weak little signals over a long distance. Very little resistance to the signal means we can pick it up at the other end without so much noise. Um, those kind of uh, old fashioned phone jacks that the operator would connect you to, uh, different circuits in, on phones in the old days, um, are these quarter inch jacks. You might notice they might have a couple of rings on them or just one. We'll talk about what those do in just a second. These are often used for line level audio after it's been boosted up to go in between different bits of hardware. Um, there are other cables. This one on the far right here doesn't even carry sound per se. It's uh, MIDI data. You might have an electronic keyboard that sends information. This key has been pressed at this velocity and send that into the computer that can then have an imaginary virtual instrument. Um, and control any sort of thing you want. Oh, there's more cables, don't worry. I love cables, personally. I have a huge stash of them upstairs. And you know what? They come in handy. Uh, you might see what's called an RCA connector. It's that gold with the nubbin in the middle. Um, those are usually connecting your home stereo equipment and stuff, but they can carry audio at line level again around. We're very used to the small version of the quarter inch jack, the eighth or 3.5 millimeter, that we plug our headphones into all kinds of things. Or not anymore, since everything's Bluetooth. 
And there's all kinds of other cables you might encounter. You can send, convert audio into data and send it over Ethernet. There are locking BNC connectors, optical. Uh, that one on the bottom is Speak On. It's a special put in and twist locking cable for speakers. Oh, there's so many cables. But uh, you will most likely be using XLR and the quarter inch ones. What's inside a cable? Haven't you always wanted to know? It may end in one jack, but inside your cable are several conductors. That is, these wires that can each carry uh, a signal. There'll be a sleeve outside to try to sort of um, insulate the whole cable from noise. And it also serves as the electrical ground, always important to, to have. And then we might have, um, this cable has two of its own jacketed little wires inside it. Two, uh, that's great. But why? Nope, it's not that computer. Um, <clears throat> well, let's use these cables as an example of something cool we can do. The one on top is called TRS, and the one on the bottom, TS, because there's a tip, a ring, and a sleeve. They're separated because uh, that way there are three different areas on that TRS cable that you can conduct electricity through, and then they don't get on top of each other. And just two areas on the TS. A, uh, you can carry one signal, one hot signal. Your guitar cable, when you plug in your electric guitar, only needs one hot signal on the tip and then the sleeve to connect to ground. Um, RCA cables are like that too. One conductor and then a ground. But up there, two conductors on the TRS. What can we do with that? One cable, two separate signals. We can do a couple of things. First, carry stereo audio, right and left channel, right? We plug in our headphones, that way we can hear in beautiful stereo, uh, like so. And the relative level of the signal in either kind of tells our brain it's somewhere in this sound stage. That's not all we can do though. Here is another fancy thing we can do with the fact that we have two conductors. First, a way about how sound works. We can represent it in these waves. If we have a sound wave and then we have its exact opposite, when the uh, amplitude is at its peak there, the other one is at its bottom of its trough. So these two are completely opposite. When we put them together, they cancel each other out. The sound is gone. Well, that's interesting, so what? Um, what we can do, if both sides of equipment agree that they can do this and are set up to do it, you send your signal along one of those conductors. You purposely send the inverted opposite signal on the other conductor. And then they get to the far end and are put back together again in a certain way. Well, again, why? So what? Over the course of going along this cable, it'll pick up some noise as well even the best cables. That's represented by the little, the little stuff in that diagram. The advantage of having the opposites along the cable is that the noise they pick up will be the same in both. When you get to the other end and invert the polarity again, the noise goes away and the signal is there, beautiful and pure and strong. The noise disappears. It's like, a, it's, it's amazing, it's magic. Um, and it helps reduce noise in long cable runs. It's very complicated to think about, but if I were to sum it up, less noise, good. Um, you can even convert different kinds of signals to each other. Uh, this is a direct injection DI box. You plug in a unbalanced, that is just one conductor, high impedance, high electrical resistance, uh, signal, like an electric guitar or bass or something like that, and then that converts it into a balanced connection, that fanciness we discussed, and you can put it over an XLR cable and take it very far. Just to say that you can twiddle your audio to and fro, convert it into different forms with little boxes like this. Other things they can do is um, eliminate this hum that comes from a ground loop, that's when uh, two different sound sources are connected to different electrical grounds or something 
Anyway, if you hear a hum, you could just flick this switch and it goes away. Uh, you can take stereo signals and sum them down to mono, which I do for our live sound here at the library so that part of the audience doesn't hear a completely different thing from the other audience. All kinds of fun stuff. But we have cables. We may end up with lots of cables, like me, or you may have not so many. They will get tied into horrible spaghetti knots. This is just a fact of life. Um, it's not a fact of life that we have to accept, though, because there is a proper way to coil one's cables. Um, she does a great job of it in this uh, video, but I'll do it in real life for you guys. Uh, why do we want to coil our cables right? Why don't we just go around the elbow like you see people do? Um, so unless you like getting knots in your cables, uh, damaging the cable's wires, perhaps, inside as a twist develops in this cable as you wrap it around your elbow. Eventually it might break those little wires inside. Or if you don't want to spend 90% of your waking life picking apart a cable when, oh, say the event's about to start and you have this mess of cable you need to connect one thing to another, speaking from experience, there's a way to do it. Let's take our cable. <clears throat> and there are actually a couple of ways to accomplish this, but the one I use, I take my paw, Across goes the end of the cable, and I start making loops. I'll make myself a loop and bring it in like so, with my uh, palm down. This is just kind of a, a loop. Now, to avoid putting a twist in, we're going to make another loop, but I'm going to do this maneuver and fold it so that my palm is up. I'm going to kind of add it to this growing loop in my left hand, over the top, under the bottom, over the top, under the bottom, over the top, under the bottom, adding and adding and adding to this coil we have here. This is a little tighter than maybe I would ordinarily do this, but I don't have a lot of room. Over, under, over, under, over, under. And then the idea is you can take your cable and throw it across the room, and it's all straight. Isn't that amazing? I think it's amazing. And it'll save you a lot of time and a lot of frustration. But that's the official, one official way to coil cables. I think there's a way of doing a figure eight on the floor that's also um, a way of doing it, and you can have it coming the other way, but my brain only has room for one physical procedure. Yes, yes. Okay, we've gone through the cables, however, whatever kind of cable that is. We now hit the other side, the preamp. Are you excited or what? Um, those puny little microphone signals need to put on some serious beef. They need to work out if they're going to be uh, cavorting on the beach with all our other line level audio sources. Um, a way of measuring it, or just to show you the difference between the levels we expect. Microphone level could be way down at negative 60s and negative 40 decibels by the, the forget, I forget even what that measurement is. Consumer level in your consumer audio gear is up at another and pro level is up at uh, yet further. Another measurement is the ordinary signal. Just to, do, to show that microphone signals are weak. Um, we need to boost them up and we have microphone preamps for this purpose. All we need to do is twist a knob. And remember how I said condenser microphones need this external power so that they can even work. Um, almost any preamp you're going to plug into will have the option by physical button or you can turn it on in software or something like that, applying this 48 volt phantom power. Why is it called phantom power? because it actually travels along the same wires that we're using to conduct our signal, but in a way that microphones that don't use it just ignore, and microphones that do use it, use it. Phantom power, because it's there, but it's kind of not, but it is, but it's not. Whoa. We are probably going to be recording with a computer, or even an iPad, or something like that. Uh, maybe not big reel-to-reel tape decks and stuff. So to get between this audio signal that we've taken all this way and our computer, we use an interface. 
There could be all kinds of little interfaces. And these are often boxes that uh, you add on. This is the device that converts the audio to and from the digital realm. It'll connect to your computer, um, and it'll do so by a few different methods. They can look a little different, but they all do the same sort of thing. They'll usually connect these days with USB. Um, that could look like the old rectangular type A. Um, they might connect with a type B, kind of a more squarish one, um, or your fancy type C these days. They'll come with the right cable. You might even have some that go over Thunderbolt, which is uh, super USB, kind of, with even more bandwidth that can move across. Um, and there are some of those interfaces, but USB does just fine. On that interface, sometimes they're quite simple. All they really have to be is a microphone preamp and then something to convert it into digital signals. Um, or they might just be bristling with options and connections and ways to extend things. Here are two different levels of complexity. Up at the top, we can plug our microphones or even a quarter inch jack in the middle hole up there on the little Behringer one. We have our knobs to raise the gain for each channel. We can do a couple of other options. We can stick our headphones in and we can control how loud the speakers are. On the back, just a couple of outputs. Those go to monitor speakers so you can hear. USB plugs in. And there's a simple little switch that turns phantom power on or off both things. A little more complicated is this focus right down, focus right one down here. Same core functions, we can stick headphones onto it, two different ones now. Crank the, the volume or down, change our gain. On the back, we can add more line inputs. It can take more in at the same time. It can send more out at the same time to different places. We can do that MIDI, control um, virtual instruments with our keyboard. It even has optical in if you want to have a whole other bank of uh, preamps that you can extend it with. And then, oh, digital sound out. And uh, phantom power is on the front. Whew, and they get more complicated than that, too. Maybe you don't need all that nonsense, and uh, you don't have to go for it. Or you can go for it later. Um, some will even have a high impedance switch, so you plug your guitar directly into it, have an imaginary amplifier. Wow, they can get fancy. They might have some gimmick or feature. Uh, that one on top has uh, input transformers designed by Rupert Neve, who's a big deal in audio. Um, how much does that really improve things? I don't know, but it may sell those units really well. And some uh, might be stripped down. They don't have a lot of bells and whistles, but the preamps, the actual guts of them are really good, like this one from SSL, Solid State Logic. They make huge consoles, but because they already have that preamp technology, they put it in interfaces as well. A little simple guy here, not a whole lot of bells and whistles, but the preamps, wow, beautiful, quiet, lots of gain. How do I know? Because we have one in the recording booth. They can focus on different things, bells and whistles or uh, core quality. You might even have an all-in-one device. Um, so some of these mixers that handle a whole bunch of different channels of audio will also <coughs> They'll also be an interface and connect to your computer. This might make more sense for you starting out if you know you're going to record a whole lot of things at once. If you'd rather also physically move your little faders around rather than click mice and do all this virtually, there's things like the Zoom Live Track series up there, Tascams, Model 16, Model 12, Model 24, um, Roadcaster. Uh, the Roadcaster Pro 2 and a bunch of devices that look like this now that are aimed at podcasters. You get, say, four microphone inputs. You can easily control their levels, four different headphone outputs, and you can press these buttons to play your theme or make fart noises or whatever. Um, so kind of a specialized interface slash mixer. Or on the other end of all that fanciness, if you just want to get started, um, you can collapse the whole series of things we talked about into one device, a USB microphone. It's the microphone. Uh, it doesn't need a cable because it's all inside. It just hands it off to itself and converts it to digital signal right in the microphone. The very famous one uh, is the Blue Yeti in the middle there. Um, but there are all kinds now because, again, we have all these um, streamers and 
uh, bedroom music makers and stuff out there on the internet. So there's a big market for things like this. And if you just want to start, um, you don't want to start out fancy or you don't have a lot of money um, and you just want to see how this all works, um, you, could do, you could do this. You can't really connect more than one of these at the same time to a computer and, and be sure it's all going to work because it starts to be a little a lot for the computer to handle to have these separate USB devices. They might not allow separate devices in your programs, but it's a way to start. The library has some, now this is the older version of the uh, Blue Yeti, but something about it is it's actually kind of complicated. It, this, it can do a whole bunch of polar patterns, omni, uh, cardioid, or figure eight, or even stereo. It's got two uh, elements in there, two capsules. On the back, you can mute the microphone, mute yourself, change your headphone volume even, because on the bottom, instead of the XLR jack we'd see on an ordinary microphone, it's not there, we have USB and a headphone. So it's basically everything all in one. And they're of varying quality, but not, not bad. It's better than like the microphone in your laptop, for sure. So it might be a good place to start if you just want to dip your toe into this or don't expect to have a podcast. Everybody's got their headphones. Everybody's got their own mic. Um, <clears throat> or uh, the Rode, which one is that? The NT1 fifth generation is both, where the Yeti doesn't have an XLR out. It does, but it can also do the whole USB microphone thing. I don't want to endorse any particular product, but this is also a really well known to be a very good microphone for the price, which is around 300. And at last, we arrive in the computer. Boy, it's been a journey. Uh, we get the audio to the computer. What are we going to do with it now? We're going to use a program called a digital audio workstation. This is the software that you'll use to record your audio, arrange all the tracks, so that multiple things can be playing at the same time, process it, mix and balance all those different things, pan them around, apply any number of effects. There are a whole lot of these out on the market for a whole lot of, at a whole lot of price points to get you started. If you have an Apple thingy, you have GarageBand, because Apple makes it and it's on every iMac and MacBook and um, even a version for iPads. That is a digital audio workstation, and it's actually a pretty, it's a totally legitimate, decent one. You can have multiple tracks of audio, treat them with effects, do fairly fancy stuff. There's some others that are offered for free, Cakewalk by BandLab, there's something called SoundBridge, which I've never even seen, but um, the internet said that it was free. Uh, you often see the uh, sound recording program Audacity recommended. I'm, I'm less opposed to it nowadays. It used to not be able to do real-time effects, which you'll need when you're um, crafting your final mix, which we'll look at next time. It can do it now. I still think it's kind of clunky compared to other programs that do this. Um, going up the, the money scale, there are things like Logic Pro, which is Apple's GarageBand on steroids, Pro Tools, which, as it says, those are the tools that the pros use. That's now on a subscription model like the Adobe software. It's expensive. Um, you know, it's used by a lot of professionals, but you pay for it. I like a one, and I have liked a one for a long time called Reaper that is 50 bucks for a license, 60. Um, and they also let you try it free as long as you want if you just endure them saying, hey, maybe you could buy me at the, uh, when you fire it up after the trial period. It does everything I'd need out of this and more. It's, it'll be the one we use to just explain uh, and show the concepts next time about mixing because these all do the same functions in kind of different ways. Different workflows, the controls are in different places. Um, and there are specialty ones if you are doing certain things. Ableton Live and uh, formerly known as Fruity Loops Studio are for loop-based like electronic music makers. Um, I didn't put on there, but if you are a radio journalist type person or voice centered, uh, the company Hindenburg makes um, software digital audio workstations that are specifically for that and, are, and 
laid out for that kind of person. Make those functions easy. We're going to talk about a couple of recording um, techniques. Um, I'm going to start with vocals because that's, I mean, if you're making music, you might be singing. And if you're talking, you'll be talking with your voice. So vocals. Um, as we get to recording our stuff. But wait, but first, the concept of gain <coughs> staging. So we do need to bump those very quiet microphone signals up a lot to use it, but we can go too far. We can overdrive our gear by bumping that signal up way too much. Um, if you have a big analog desk with uh, transformers and uh, all kinds of analog iron things and tubes in it, um, you can crank it up and get a pleasant, fuzzy, warm distortion for a purposeful effect or just to make the sound a little more rich. It increases the harmonics up the, um, up the sound. Uh, but we should not do that with our digital stuff. When we get the signal too hot, too high for it, it loses its ability to describe it in numbers. Where the waveform would go do 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 do, it goes it hits a floor and ceiling, and it can't give you detail beyond that. This comes across as a very a very unpleasant distortion of the signal. It will not sound sweet. It will not sound warm. It will not sound thick or any of these other like sommelier uh, words we use for audio. Uh, it sounds like a digital buzzsaw. Uh, it's called clipping, and we don't want it. Clippy, you're bad. There are a few things that, uh, we can do to avoid this. We can set our gain so that we don't clip when we're practicing our talking. Um, make sure we don't see those little red lights on our interface that'll indicate we've done too much, we've gone too far. Um, a good level to look for, and you'll have some kind of meter indicating this. Um, is around negative 18, with zero being the maximum, the theoretical maximum in your uh, digital world. Your levels will flutter. And if you must err on the side of being a little too quiet, um, the bad part about going way too quiet is then you have to boost everything up, and with that comes just the, the own electronic noise that comes from the whole signal chain you've got going on. So there's a sweet spot right in the middle where you're not clipping, but you're not so low that you'll start recognizing hearing this noise when it comes up. But err on the side of too quiet because that's better than kind of an unrecoverable nastiness in your audio. When you're recording your vocals, and again, we will get, I know this is a lot of information, but I want it to be worth it to come to this class. Uh, you'll get this presentation and all the stuff to review later, and I'll make this recording available. When you're recording yourself, you want to monitor yourself, that is, listen to yourself in real time, in closed back headphones. Uh, there are open back headphones that like uh, audiophiles will listen to their music on, but they let sound leak out. You want a closed one, it'll keep that sound between you and your ears. Why do you want to hear yourself as you're recording? So you can hear if you um, clip, if you are wandering away from where the microphone hears best and your voice starts to sound strange, uh, tinny, or you hear more of the room than you, you can listen in real time to see if anything's going wrong that you need to correct. Or if you notice you can hear your chair squeaking, that would be a good time to catch it. Um, as I said, give yourself lots of headroom. The human voice is really dynamic. And as someone who's recorded a bunch of podcasts for the library, I can tell you, when we're just talking normally, it's one thing. And then we laugh, ha ha ha, something like that. There's a huge spike in the level of audio. There's an amazing amount of dynamic range. And if someone laughs, we could easily hit that horrible digital ceiling if we haven't given ourselves a lot of room. You might want to use a pop filter and police your plosives. These are those rings that have mesh in them and a little gooseneck, and you put them in between the microphone and you. That way you can talk to the microphone but when, you're, but when your voice makes plosives, poofs of air, if they were to just hit the diaphragm of the microphone, you hear a <laughs> because it's 
you know, the, the, the little vibrations of sound are one thing. An actual wall of air hitting them makes a terrible noise. The mesh, your poof, <laughs> your plosive hits that <clears throat> and is kind of diffused through it. <clears throat> um, mind the proximity effect. When you get very close to a microphone, you'll hear more low end. This can be like the drive time radio sound where they intentionally do this and they sound very big and right in your face and right in your ear. It's like they're in your brain. But again, that doesn't sound natural. It might be an effect you're going for, but if you back off, I think uh, often two fists is a good rule of thumb people will use, how far away from your microphone to be. Maybe not a dynamic. They like being a little bit closer. If you don't want to use a pop filter, and I kind of don't like it, having a thing in my face, um, another way you might ameliorate the plosive problem is to have the microphone looking at your mouth, looking at your mouth, but from an angle, like from off to the side. You still want to look at your mouth and capture the sound from it, but if you're not right in the way of those plosives, it just naturally reduces that problem. You might experiment with uh, the mic looking down at your mouth from above or up from below. People will say you might catch more chestiness and depth if you're looking down and catching more of that, or uh, catch more nasalness if you want that, <laughs> um, if it's looking up. I found that we tend to, when we make our plosives, they do tend to go down a bit, so down might not always be the best idea. Find the right place to record. This is really important. I know I made a big deal about all the different kinds of microphones and how nice your interface might be. Your room is the most important factor, where you are. If you're not in a good sounding room, like this terrible box, chances are you're not, you'll want to soften things up a bit. If you're in your bathroom and you clap, or in here, you'll hear a lot of reverberations. There are a lot of hard surfaces, flat walls. Here we have flat walls facing each other that can bounce sound back and forth and back and forth and make that sharp echo. Um, so the bathroom is like the worst place to record. Whereas um, your grandma's living room with lots of upholstery, bookshelf with the books all in slightly different, you know, that's slightly different levels, um, lots of soft absorbing or diffusing material is better. That'll lower the reverberations you hear just coming from the room. Um, you could do this yourself by deploying some pillows and blankets. Um, I know that radio journalists will, sometimes they'll go in the closet because there's all those clothes to absorb everything. You might even just throw a blanket over yourself as you're uh, recording, and that really does help cut out um, sound from behind you. You might not want to be close to a wall, because it's again, it's a flat plane, and the sound will be bouncing off of it. But you also might not want to be dead center in the room, because like ripples in a pond, it's kind of where the sound will reverberate through. So neither a borrower nor a lender be. Think about where that sound will be bouncing and you can diffuse or dampen it. Um, we may have all seen those sound absorbing panels that are on the wall and recording studios and stuff. The best place for those, because we can't treat our whole rooms, nor really should we, would be where sound would bounce. And you can kind of just imagine it like a pool, you know, bouncing a pool ball, what are the, the, the cue ball, off the uh, side of the wall. And that's the best place to reduce those sounds. So to sum up, as Drake tells us, flat planes, hard surfaces, empty walls, particularly parallel ones, um, computer fans and other sources of background noise, no. Absorptive and diffusive material on your walls, upholstered furniture, bookshelves with the books all different angles and made of soft material. Um, some cleverly placed absorptive panels, blankets and pillows even, those will help. Reduce that roominess, that echo. If you had yourself an acoustic guitar, let's say, typically you'd use a condenser with this, right? Capture all the detail of the strings. Um, you'd set it maybe foot, 18 inches away, and there's no right way, but this is where people have landed, essentially. And even if you don't have a guitar, this will include some of the concepts that we're talking about, particularly about placement, how much of a difference this makes. You kind of pick the spot you want to aim for to emphasize a certain part of this sound. Stringed instruments 
um, and ones particularly with steel strings, make a whole bunch of different sounds that all blend by the time they reach us and we experience them. But the microphone will be looking, you know, more closely. So, pointed at the strings, you'll hear more obviously of the zingy string and the fretting. You will hear string brilliance. Uh, if you pointed it right at the sound hole, that you might think, well, that's the sound hole. Sound comes from the sound hole. Boomy sound comes from the sound hole. Again, we actually hear the whole instrument, the resonating surfaces, the strings, what's projected out of the sound hole. If the microphone is just listening to the sound hole, it'll be boomy and unpleasant. So some people like to aim like below it or at the 12th fret, a sweet spot. You know, you can, you can move the microphone around and get different effects for your voice and for any instrument too. Um, we can think about all the post-processing and fixing it afterward that we want, but the earlier on in the chain that we get the sound we want, the better. Let's say you're recording an electric guitar. The very most classic thing to do is take a dynamic microphone like the SM57 and just shove it right up against the grill cloth. That's so loud, you say. Yeah, but remember, a dynamic microphone, you can drop it off the top of a house and it'll be okay. It can handle an enormous amount of sound. You get a very direct sound that way. You might try the sound of a ribbon or condenser a bit farther back because they are a little more delicate. Um, or you can use multiple microphones at once to capture the sound as if you were getting a little more of the room or the slightly different sound of being farther away from the speaker, but get up close as well and mix them together. When you use multiple microphones though, if they're a certain distance apart from each other, just physics again, the sound will hit them at different times and you get this sort of weird filtering effect that'll make the frequencies sound odd. So a good rule of thumb is to have microphones three times as far from each other as they are from the source. Again, we might, just, we might just be thinking record a voice with one microphone. We don't have to worry about that. But if you are thinking of something like that, stick to that rule of thumb. <clears throat> so you're a boom, 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 bass player and you got your bass amp. You might want to switch out uh, to a large diaphragm dynamic. There are such things. Um, start a little off center of the speaker cone and move around to taste. The closer to the middle of a speaker cone you are, the more high end, the more to the uh, outside, the more low end generally. Uh, and this is an example of multiple microphones on one source. I've also got a condenser out there farther away. And you can blend those sounds. Just keep one, throw out the other. The world is your oyster when recording. Of course, with the bass, you can also just record it directly. That's that direct injection I was talking about. We don't go through amplifiers and such. We can just take that signal um, and stick it right in our, our interface or a direct injection box and just get that signal directly. The bass, this works well and you can twiddle it afterward. The electric guitar sound when you do this is a little strange. And you might be using instruments that just have line outs themselves, synthesizers, things like that. What comes out of them is just line level audio. Well, all right, we'll just put that in the line level inputs of our interface and we can capture that coming in. Plug in and they work, boom. Whew. Now don't forget the part two is coming up because we only got the sound to the computer. We have a lot more to do to it. Um, some resources I like a lot, and I just want to point out, and you can look at later, the Bedroom Producers blog, if you want to get into this stuff. The wonderful thing about it is all the free plugins and software they point you to, because um, I love this, but I don't have a lot of money to be thrown around. Um, you can spend lots of money on audio stuff. Uh, so I like when things are free, and I can play with them. Um, the Home Recording Forum is a nice, nice forum to ask questions and learn from others. Uh, this is getting a little out of date now, but you might not be as much of a microphone nerd as I have become, but the Recording Hacks mic database, all kinds of different um, statistics on different microphones. Some YouTube uh, channels I enjoy, there are a whole lot of them. Um, there's all kinds of good ones I don't know about, and you may not like some of these, and I think some of these have stopped producing stuff, but anyway, there's some. Um, the last two are uh, 
kind of rigorous comparisons of different microphone models if you want to like preview what one sounds like, except the one guy is very annoying. You just kind of have to deal with that. But he's very, he does the same exact same tests every time, so you can compare microphones without having to buy them or find them. Uh, and of course, there's recording magazines, Sound on Sound. Um, Bobby Ausinski has written a lot of books about um, the, for recording engineers and mixing and mastering. Um, and you can check the library. I've made sure we have a few good recording books. And I, speaking of the library, I do want to talk about LinkedIn Learning, formerly lynda.com before all kinds of fun uh, corporate acquisitions and it ended up in Microsoft's hands. But they are online video courses that will take you through um, all sorts of tech topics from computer software to even businessy stuff that I certainly don't care about, but um, also recording technology and uh, video recording taught by professionals, unlike me, but you don't get them live. Taught by professionals and just like a, a big long course that can bring you your skills way up. And you have access to that. Yeah, you have access to that with your library card. Ask your reference librarian today. Um, next time, we will get into what we do with our audio once we've got it, digitized it. We'll mix our various signals together. We'll apply all kinds of fun effects, EQ, dynamics, delays, refurbs, modulation. We'll talk about loudness and mastering so that we can fi finish off our product and render it out. That is, take what's a project to work in progress and bake the cake and end up with one audio file. And because a lot of us are probably thinking about podcasting, um, I'll talk a little bit about podcast hosting and how you get going with that and how that all works. That's the last slide, right? Yes. Woo. Okay. So that's a lot of information. But again, you'll get the um, presentation and I can make this recording available too if you want to relive the experience. Um, I hope I'll see you for part two. And once you um, are feeling empowered and knowledgeable. I do also want to point out the library has a recording booth that you can reserve uh, for two hour blocks at a time. So you can go and record your podcast and uh, do a little mixing work, um, take your project and work on it elsewhere too, and use this quiet treated recording space with some pretty nice microphones, if I do say so myself, because I picked them out. Um, that's available and you can find that on our website too or ask the reference librarians about it, if you want to jump in before we've even finished the class. But I hope to see you next time. Thank you all for coming. Thank you so much.